Well, good evening, everyone. Um, this is the second week we have some new friends. Um, I'm very pleased that everyone is able to join us. Firstly, roll call for the moment. We have Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Jackie's there. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Kelly Sedipus has joined us. Kelly is on staff from the Law Library. She'll be providing some information tonight and um, we'll be leading the session next week. Shelley, we have you online. Hi Shelley. Hello. And um, as usual we're recording the session. Now before I start, does anyone have any questions that they wish to raise? Any discussion points of interest? No. Okay. Kelly, um, while we've got you, while we've got the benefit of you online, would you like to introduce yourself more formally and um, let us know how you can assist the students? And I hand it over to you. No problem. Um, hi everyone. Um, yes, I'm I'm the law librarian here at the the university. Uh, what I can be is your your point of um, reference, I suppose, or point of need. If you if you're looking for some information and you can't find it, or if you're trying to navigate through the library website or a particular database, and you're striking problems. So um, today, what I was hoping to do is just take the opportunity to introduce myself, so you know that I am there, um, and then also maybe point you towards the Law Lib Guide, which you may not have had a chance to have a look at yet. Um, but I guess it's, it's, it's also, I know that it's tough sometimes studying um, off campus and, and studying by distance, so it's nice to be able to um, put a name to the face kind of thing. So I guess I'm trying to say is don't be too scared of the library. <laughs> Next week, Kelly will lead the session, and um, will be um, uh, I will participate uh, rather than the other way around. You know, Kelly will host the session. All right. Is there anything that you wish to take us through tonight, Kelly, or leave it all for next week? Uh, yeah, John. If I can um, maybe show people the the library website sure. um, and maybe just introduce them to the Law Lib Guide. Okay. Please. So, are you happy for me to take the to share my screen? Okay. Okay. Okay, so hopefully everyone, you can still hear me okay? Um, and you can see on your screen the, the library's website. Um, I imagine not too many of you have had a chance to go to this particular website yet. Um, what I wanted to point out were the different ways that you can get in contact with us. So you'll notice on towards the bottom right hand side of the screen, um, just there there's contact us and there's different ways that you can make contact with us. We've got a 1300 number so when the library is open you can give us a call and if I'm not here there are other librarians that can help you. Um, we've got an ask the library area which is like our frequently asked questions. So you can go there, have a look and see if, if there's an answer to your question. If there isn't, there's an email that you can, um, or a box where you can actually send through your query. Of course, we've got an email address. We've also started uh, having a presence on Facebook and Twitter. So they're the newer things that we've been adding. Um, but I guess the big thing is just not to be too afraid of getting in contact. Um, I certainly come across students that have spent hours and even days trying to find um, particular information, not necessarily law students, but all different kinds of students. And while that's great that you, you're having a go and you, you're trying things, don't get it to the point where you're so frustrated. Um, just give it a go. If it's still not working, get in contact with us and hopefully we'll be able to assist. So that's how to contact us. Um, the other place I wanted to show you is the Law Lib Guide. So at the top of the page on the right hand side, you'll see there's a link for Lib Guides Assignment Help. So I'm just going to click on here. Now we've got Lib Guides for all different kinds of subject areas and different kinds of formats of information. But the one I want to draw your attention to is up here. You'll notice that there's a law area 
if you click on the little plus arrow beside law, it just opens up some of the different guides that we have and you'll see that we've got a law library guide. So this is a work in progress. Um, it's something that I try to update, um, change, add things that I think may not um, be there or try to clarify things as we're going along. So um, certainly if you, if you are going to have a look at it quite regularly, you will notice that there are changes there. Um, but I guess the big thing to point out is that there's different tabs across the screen and the thing really to understand about the library guide is it's not designed to be read all at once. I mean, certainly if you've got the time and, and you want to do that, you can, but it can be something that you just dip into as needs be. So, um, so today what I wanted to point out was the dictionaries and encyclopedias. So they're often a great starting point for library research because um, if you're not very familiar with the subject area that you're researching, um, you can go to these, these resources and get more information. So it might be on a particular um, word um, that is used that you're not familiar with or it might be a particular piece of legislation or type of law. So just be aware that those things are there and that there's links through to that. Um, that was probably the, the main bit I wanted to go through today and next week what I'll be looking at is just showing you through the main databases that we have and the kinds of resources that you're going to find when you go to those different databases. So um, I guess is there is there any questions initially? So this is um, a, um, a, a sort of modernization of the original site is it Kelly because it looks rather different from when I looked at it uh, um, you know, a little while ago. It is something that we've, do you mean the law library guide specifically yeah. or? Yeah. yeah the law library guide. It is something that I've been trying to streamline um, and trying to really focus on what's important. Um, so yeah, it has, it has undergone some changes, definitely. Yeah, so I, so I've saved the databases as a favourite. Um, I haven't actually, I I, obviously I can't click onto your tab, but yep. could you just click on that, just see if I can uh, see if it's the same as I've started? Yeah, we've looked at, we've divided in, them into Osley and LexisNexis, so there's information yeah. under each of those, <laughs> um, but certainly they're just the beginning ones, so there's others to sort of... Um, demonstrate as well. So the other ones that you might come across is um, we've got Westlaw, um, we've also got some material on CCH as well. Mm -hmm. Now those kind of databases are also talked about underneath the different kinds of resources, so um, commentaries or legislation. Yes, that is quite different, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. More condensed. Yes, I guess so. It's it's so that um, we can try to make it very clear what is covered by each database because I think that's where people would have been lost in the past. Yeah, there were rather too many choices uh, that when you actually looked at it, you could see that there were probably around about 10 to choose from and you think, well, where do I start? Yes. And I think I know, and um, after talking to you, I think um, we actually do have a, a section on the the website which is databases for law. So that could be um, something else that we're looking at. Let me just go back to the library homepage or the LibGuide, sorry. Okay. And I'm just going into all library databases. And you can actually select by subject. So this is where all of the different databases are listed. Uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the page I've got up. Yeah. Yeah. A favorite. yeah. So that's, I mean, that's a, a, that's a good resource, but more so for when you know, um, when you know a little bit more about what's in each database and what the kinds of things that you want to research at, the, at that time. Whereas the law lib guide is, I guess, a bit more prescriptive. Pres prescriptive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. That's all right. Any other questions? Um, no? 
Mr. John here. Can I just make a comment that in practice, I tend to use LexisNexis and Ostly um, the most. They'd be my first points of call. But apart from that, I use the um, court's website uh, for judgments and um, yeah. that includes QCAT, the area that I'm um, involved in as well. And a, a program called Smokeball, which is attached to a program uh, called Leap. But um, okay. I think um, LexisNexis and Ostly would be probably the places I'd go looking for legal research. Yeah, and they're, they're certainly the ones that um, I tend to go to as well. They've um, certainly with LexisNexis, um, we've got a lot of our case law through LexisNexis, so it is a good resource for that. Um, some of the other databases have different kinds of materials, so we've got Westlaw. Westlaw's got quite a few um, journals through there, so if you're looking for journal articles on particular topics, Westlaw can be really useful for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of knowing, well, which database should I go to? If I'm looking for case law, well, I'm, I'm going to go to LexisNexis or I'm going to go to Ostley, which is another free uh, free resource that that is um, very useful. Um, Dom Dominic Catter said that he uh, tends to use Ostley a lot because of the Noted Up tab that is present. It's called Note Up tab. It's, it's very good. Note Up. Yeah, no tuck tab, yeah. Yep. Um, I must admit, I, I was a little bit lost by that, but I did have a look at it and uh, still a little bit smoky. Yeah, I, I feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I can, again, from a, a, a practical perspective, I use Note Up a lot in Lexis, in um, Ostley. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with Note Up, if you go into Ostley, can we, can we do that, Kelly? Can you go in? Yes, yeah, sure. I've got a link so I can go straight in. All right. Um, let's have a look at some Queensland legislation, if you would, Kelly. Yeah. So, Queensland Consolidated Act, or? Yeah. Let's have a look at the um, Property Agents and Motor Dealers Act, perhaps. This one here. And um, if we look at, um, we'll just go down. And this is co completely random off the top of my head, but uh, we'll just go back a little bit further down, further down into the real estate section. Sorry. To <laughs> down, Kelly. That's all right. I've got real estate agents. Okay. Let's have that a look at. Um, Oh, okay, section 133, we'll see if there's anything in there. Appointment of real estate agents. If there's any cases on it, um, so that's that's the legislation. If we now look at note up up the top, click on that, and what you'll see there is a selection of cases based on relevance. On the far right hand side, you'll see that the first case is regarded as 100% relevant. And you'll see that it's a Supreme Court Court of Appeal decision, which was um, handed down on the 15th of July 2011. Correct me if I'm interpreting this incorrectly, Kelly. Um, so if you if you've got a dispute in relation to that particular section, click on Note Up, and it will show you a list of cases and other materials um, by degree of relevance to the to the decision, and um, it's a great way to research. So it acts as um, a filter in some ways. Yes, um, and uh, a guide as to relevance. So right. that's, that's um, a really good resource. Thank you for that, Kelly. No problem. Now, could I just make a couple of students have made um, a query, have had queries in relation to law diaries um, or law dictionaries rather. Oh yeah. And um, I've said to them very unhelpfully, look, don't go out and buy one, but there are plenty of resources online. Do you have any recommendations for students in relation to... Yeah. Life? Let me just go back to... Sorry, I'm just going to click back. Thank you. Oh, it's probably gone to the wrong one. Okay, I'll just go back to here. Okay. 
So the, the big one that I usually recommend to people is that Encyclopedic Australian Legal Dictionary. So that's the one available on LexisNexis. So um, it's, it's good for um, an overview of things. We've also got some other dictionaries through Oxford and, and Credo, but um, I guess um, because it's LexisNexis, it, it's got a, an extra tick, I suppose. Um, we've also got um, Halsbury's Laws of Australia that can be very useful as well. So they tend to be the, the two that I recommend to people. In practice, I use Halsbury quite a lot. Yeah. I like Halsbury. I actually have a question about that. Um, if we, most of the exams are open book exams. Does that, can you use a phone with a link to an online encyclopedia or do you have to have a hard copy if you need one? I'll have to take that one under advisement, Shelley. Sorry. I'll, I'll make some inquiries about exam procedures. I think um, this year, this course has been selected for um, having the exam conducted online completely from your own terminal, as I understand it. But, uh, right, so Shelley, could I ask a favour? Would you mind posting that as a question on Moodle and okay. I'll make some inquiries? No worries. Thank you. Kelly, another query um, from students was to do with finding the um, original decision in a Court of Appeal decision. And um, are you able to provide any recommendations? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, you're right. Um, I, would, I would... Sorry? No, sorry Kelly, after you. I was just going to say, um, I would tend to go to LexisNexis for that and um, we've, we've got um, a lot of our case law through there. So I guess it depends on uh, or, um, or perhaps on Osley, some of that material is there. Have you found that John? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, Osley is an, an amazing resource. It seems to be growing all the time. There's things that are available through it. Um, but yes, it is. Uh, LexisNexis or Osley would be my the two that I would certainly be trying. I don't know if we're covering much of the area that you'll be covering next week, but um, should we have a quick look at Court's website? Yeah, sure. Let me just. I've got. So you're looking at the Queensland Court or Queensland Court, the judgments. Okay, I don't know if I've got a link to it in here. Let me see. Um, okay, so I'll just go to Google and see if I can find it that way. So the Queensland Supreme Court, maybe, or? Uh, yes, that should get us there. Supreme Court decisions. Uh, yep. Decisions. Okay. That's it? Yep, we're in the right place. That's, yeah, that's very good. And you've got there the list of Court of Appeal, District Court, Magistrates Court, and um, QCAT on the, the left hand side as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that might be another case for students to go looking for case law. Okay. Um, Thank you, Kelly. Yes, I'm not quite sure whether that is covered in the library guide, but I will look into that. Okay. Yes, if we could create a link that would be... Be yeah, good. definitely. Yeah, I've got that one as one of my favourites. Excellent. So click on to it. Okay, lovely. Okay, is, is there anything else that you'd like to look at, John, or...? No, nothing at this stage from me, but... Um, okay. After, if there's any other questions, then perhaps uh, I can just yeah. give us an overview of what you plan to do next week. Kelly, if that's all right. Next, uh, okay. Um, really what I'm looking at is going from database to database and just showing exactly what we have 
available through the different databases. And I guess that's that's something to bring up as well. I know um, with one of the textbooks, I can't think of the, the name of it, but the, the green one that's very sort of um, looks at legal research, It a lot of what is in that particular book or at least some of it is uh, is demonstrating material that we don't necessarily subscribe to. So um, that's just something to bring up that even though it might be covered in the, the legal research book doesn't necessarily mean that um, our library has a subscription to it. So what I'll be doing is going through each of the databases and looking at what we actually have in each of them. So whether um, this is a good place to find case law, whether this is something that we can go to to have a look for comment commentary, um, legislation, so all the different kinds of material that may um, come up in the course of the, of the um, term, I suppose. The so other point, sorry, yeah, the, the other point about that book I found is that very often the screenshots that they show on the page are not the same uh, screen that you see when you go into the website because they've obviously been modified. So I think this book version 2000 and 2010, so it's, it's a little bit out of date, I suppose, isn't it? Yes, and it's very, that's a common thing. The databases, it, it seems to be um, that they will update things quite a lot. They'll have a platform change and um, I mean, that's something that um, librarians kind of um, deal with as well, I guess, in that our material can be quite can become quite dated quite easily. So um, yes, I can certainly see what you're saying with the... Yeah, with it's very frustrating when, you, when you're looking at the uh, the page in front of you and then you have a screen you think, hang on a minute, am I on the right one? Yeah. Uh, because they're showing things that aren't there and uh, once you tweak that probably it has been updated, it's, it's not too much of a problem. Yep. And that's another thing that I can answer your questions with. Um, we've, we've had queries from students, do we have this particular resource? And that's the kind of thing that I can give you a straight yes or no answer to. So it sort of saves you um, investing any more time in that, I suppose. Can I ask you one right now? Um, yeah. Law we have access to law. We don't have law lex, but I think that's a is that a I think that's a freely available. Um, it's a one of the textbooks I think, and there's parts that um, you need a subscription to. I was just checking. It's all right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. Certainly, we don't have a subscription to to that, so we only have access to the freely available stuff. Any others? No, I think. So. That's covered uh, most of my queries that I've had. One of the big ones that comes up a lot is people are looking for a, a, um, a resource called the Laws of Australia. And um, um, that is a very similar sort of product to the Hallsbury's Laws of Australia, but through different um, database vendors or different publishers. So we don't have access to that Laws of Australia. We have access to Hallsbury's. Um, so that's one of the, the questions that sometimes comes up. Yeah, I think I did a Google search on that and, they, and it said that it's $17,000 a year yes. <laughs> subscribe. So you can understand why it would be a bit sparing. And a lot of those decisions are made, um, you know, are based on, well, which one would fit our students or our staff the best. Um, so those decisions are sort of ongoing. Uh, just uh, one other small point to keep it going. Uh, sometimes they refer to loose leaf services. Now, are those really out of date now? Yes, pretty much. Um, the loose leaf... Um, probably about 10, 15 years ago were more common. Um, but now because most of that material is digitised and they can be updated online, it used to take what would actually happen in a library is that you'd sub subscribe and every month or every two months um, you'd get these loose leaf and you'd have to slot in the changes to whether it's law or um, a case law into that particular binder. And that required somebody to actually do that. And I actually did that when I first started in the library. 
So, um, yes, but it's very different now that we've got things available electronically. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kelly. Any further questions? <laughs> no, I think that's, uh, that's, that's good. It's certainly clearing up a few little queries I had. All right. Um, and as, as mentioned, Kelly will take the session next week. So, Kelly, um, feel free to stay with us while we continue, if that's all right, unless there's anything... Oh, that would be great. ...at this stage. All right, well, I might take the screen then. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, what can you see at the moment? All uh, right, we've gone back to you now, John. Just, uh, just you okay. with us at the top. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments in relation to the advantage that you have now, because of the electronic um, material available. Just to follow on from a point that Kelly made, when I first started. Um, it was very difficult to practice in a small law firm context. Originally, I was in a, a large law firm with the resources of a proper library, library and librarian. But when I did go into a small law firm, it was a bit of a culture shock because in order then to access the latest um, legislation, you simply needed to, buy, you needed to buy the legislation. There was no such thing as online version. If you didn't have it in your possession in your room, then you just didn't have it. Um, and uh, to update uh, legislation required purchasing the Amendment Act and then physically and laboriously cutting out the sections of the amendments. So if, for example, Section 200 of the Act had changed, then you would go to the Amendment Act and cut out the new version of Section 200 and literally paste it in with glue over the top of the old Section 200 in the original version. So um, that process of cutting and pasting literally meant that um, when you went to court with a piece of legislation, uh, you had bits and pieces hanging off it and glued and stapled um, and uh, photocopied bits and, and pieces. So you can imagine that in a small law firm, uh, it was very difficult to compete because, um, for one thing, you were stressing over whether or not you had the up-to-date version of the legislation. So treat yourself as privileged that you now have this online version um, material at your fingertips which makes it um, much easier for people in remote regions, as many of us are in this uh, university course, to compete um, with the well-researched large firms. The second thing I'll mention is um, when I was halfway through my introduction to law subject uh, back in 1977 at um, the University of Queensland, I didn't achieve at the halfway mark as well as I'd like, so I saw the lecturer and explained that um, I'd really uh, covered every point that was in the textbook and the material and the lectures, I thought very well. And the reality shock to me at that stage was when the lecturer asked if I'd read the cases that I'd referred to in the material. And I said, well, I hadn't actually read them. I've, I've referenced them. I've, I've basically um, regurgitated the material that was presented in the lecture. And uh, I was told that um, if you want to do well in law, you actually have to read the cases, you have to read the original material. So just a, a word of caution there, that having the material presented to you in the summarised format is all very well, and that might be good enough for a pass, but if you want to do well, you need to go into and read the case and understand the case. Um, now, you've got, to be a bit, you've got to be a bit balanced here, because some of these cases are huge, and if I encourage you to read every word, I'm doing you a disservice. But you certainly do need to selectively read the material and try to understand from the original source and not just rely on the secondary commentary. I don't mean to scare you off, but just give you that word of warning. All right. Um, what I propose to do is move on and continue some discussions on what we were talking about last week. Um, <coughs> talking about work sectors. Oh, before I do, can I just get some feedback? Um, is, it, is my voice coming through clearly enough, or is, is it sort of an echo, staccato sound? Just give me the... That's fine. It's okay? 
Um, now, we were talking about solicitors and barristers and um, the merged profession. I'm just going to share my screen with some notes that I've prepared in that regard. And I appreciate we're a little behind in that this is really from week one, but I think we um, need to cover it. So, are you looking at um, a screen now that has my... Okay. Okay, so we're talking about solicitor or barrister. Um, in Queensland, we have a separate profession for uh, essentially for each, but in other jurisdictions, there's what's called a merged profession, which means that um, people can be admitted as a solicitor and barrister. Where I practice and the field I practice gives me some unique advantage in that um, I'm essentially a solicitor advocate, which means that I spend most of my time in court doing advocacy work. Um, the advantage that I've got is that we don't really have a local bar. So um, I'm able to conduct hearings, trials, bail applications, um, um, a lot of matters in superior courts where in Brisbane, uh, those sorts of tasks would be briefed out to counsel, to barristers. So does anyone have any questions about solicitor versus barrister, the sort of things that we do? Okay. In Queensland, yes. the, uh, the, the barrister has the, the right of appearance. Is that, is that correct? So uh, in Queensland, the barrister has the right of appearance? Is that yes. What? Uh, certainly the, the barristers do have the right of appearance, but um, to my knowledge, there's nothing where a, there, there is no uh, particular uh, piece of advocacy that can't be done by a solicitor. So, for example, if we have a bail application, a contested bail application, in the magistrate's court, even though it might relate to a serious crime, um, it, it is still possible and very likely that a solicitor will appear to argue that mail application. Now, that doesn't mean that the barrister can't, and very often barristers do come into court and argue those things. But typically, um, in the magistrate's court for bail applications, solicitors would, would do, that, do that. Following on from that, there may be a series of mentions. Um, there may be, may be a summary hearing in the magistrate's court and the summary hearing is where the magistrate will hear the evidence and make a decision as to guilt or otherwise. In that situation, um, the um, solicitor can appear as the advocate and very often does appear as the advocate. Uh, again, many solicitors choose to brief counsel to have a barrister attend to do that hearing, maybe doing the preliminary mentions on the way through, but uh, I generally um, prefer to see, well, I, I conduct my own hearings for the most part, and uh, would only very rarely brief a barrister to do any work in the in the magistrate's court. But that's a matter for you to decide which way you want to go if you're a solicitor. In the higher courts, um, solicitors very often appear in mentions, in what we call callovers, where a list of matters might be progressively worked through. Uh, you know, we call that a callover. So solicitors very often appear in that. Solicitors will often appear in what we call sentence in the criminal jurisdiction, which is where the, um, uh, the client enters a plea of guilty, um, to which the um, judge sentences after hearing from, from both prosecution and defence. So solicitors will often appear in sentence matters, and um, that's not to say that barristers don't. Um, more, it's more likely that it would be a barrister than a solicitor, but barristers um, are not the only ones that will routinely appear. Where we see solicitors appear much less often, and it, indeed it's quite rare, is in a jury trial, in a criminal law context, in the Supreme or District Court. Um, that's almost exclusively the, uh, the domain of barristers. But it's not to say that we can't as solicitors appear, and um, it's not something that I've done, um, but there are certainly many instances of solicitors who have appeared in a trial situation. Um, in front of a jury. 
So does that answer your question in a very long-winded way, John? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Any other questions on the different work that is undertaken by solicitors or barristers? John, can I just ask one thing? Yes, Jackie. Might be a silly question. When you said that solicitors can do what you just said, barristers, it's almost exclusively barristers, but solicitors can do it. Why is it that way? Is that just the solicitor's choice? Mostly, yes. Okay. Um, as a solicitor, you need to be careful to work within the area of expertise that you're comfortable working in. And you know, mm -hmm. uh, for example, again, in my instance, I'm very comfortable in appearing in the magistrate's court. I probably do most days. But when it comes to the district court, um, in front of a jury, the rules of evidence become much more important and more focused, um, and uh, the consequences of, of not getting uh, something something in the advocacy right is um, more serious. It may lead to a, a mistrial and discharge of the jury. A matter of expertise, experience, um, uh, time constraints can come, can come in. I mean, I've, I've I heard barristers say that um, their practice is sometimes like uh, akin to a, a bathtub. Um, it, it fills with the first case. When that matter is finished, the jury makes its decision uh, that that bathtub is completely empty. And the next day, they fill it up with something new. Um, whereas solicitors tend to have many cases on the run and um, will not necessarily have that's that luxury of being able to concentrate and focus completely on the case that they're dealing with at the time. They might have to be worried about getting the, the, the subpoenas out to make sure that their witnesses are in attendance for next week's trial, uh, whereas the barrister perhaps would just expect that the solicitor would have those sorts of things organised. Um, it's a little bit like, in some ways in the high courts, the barristers perhaps uh, take the role of the lead actor in a movie context and the solicitors are the producers. They're the ones that need to worry about the logistics, making sure that the client, the witnesses, the funds, everything else is ready behind the scenes. Um, I hope that explains it a bit more, Jackie. Yeah, perfectly. Thanks, John. Do it, but it's a matter of juggling. Any other questions there? Or Does that mean then that barristers have better hours? <laughs> oh, is that you, Rachel? No. No, yes. no I, I think that barristers work very long hours and they, they have some enormous amounts of stress at times that they need to cope with, but uh, for the most part they do it very well. Oh, you, get, you get used to the long hours no matter what you're doing in law. I think I made that comment publicly. Sorry, don't mean to scare you off, just the reality. Um, the types of work areas that you can work in, private, government, academic, corporate or community sectors. Um, yeah, I'm sorry talking about myself a bit here, but for example, in, in my context, I am a, uh, have a crossover practice. I'm a private lawyer working primarily in um, magistrates called criminal law, but I'm also a government employee through QCAT, an academic, I guess, through Central Queensland. And because I'm on the College Council for the Fraser Coast Anglican College, I have some corporate legal work, although I don't get paid for that. And um, Magistrate Guthridge, as he was, uh, and myself, set up the um, Community Legal Centre in uh, Harvey Bay. So we, we act as community lawyers as well. And in the, in the books, you'll see that different um, practitioners work in different fields. So I just happen to cross over a few of those. Um, the page reference numbers are a reference to the uh, new lawyer, James and Field. As I said yes, last week, I think that's an excellent publication. And um, different uh, categories of firms, depending on the number of people in those firms. Page 15 talks about partnership or employed lawyer. And um, page 18 talks about alternative dispute resolution. Uh, national accreditation is something that uh, if you're uh, looking at that field, you should aim to uh, achieve. And, um, sorry, move that cursor down. That arrow seems to want to come with me wherever I go. 
Um, the, um, if you're going to be a mediator, uh, try and seek national accreditation. It's always a problem. Now, did, in, uh, did anyone do any reading in terms of the different types of practice areas that you might be working in or studying? Okay. Now, did uh, anyone have any problems with determining what we mean by... So I'll just run through with administrative law. You know what that's all about? It's essentially taking an um, issue with decisions made by the executive arm of um, government. So decisions made of an administrative nature can be the subject of a review, and that's typically a judicial review in a court context or a review through a tribunal, uh, normally uh, QCAT for state government matters or perhaps the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or the Social Assessment Appeals Tribunal um, in a Commonwealth context. So administrative law you'll, you'll come across is all about dealing with um, a review of those decisions. Civil procedure, um, talking about uh, practice which is non-criminal practice in the courts context. And um, Professor Stephen Colburn um, will provide you with some expert advice and uh, information in that area in his courses. And uh, he's a, a co-author, lead author of one of the leading texts in the area. Company law, of course, dealing with companies, but bear in mind there are a great number of different types of companies that um, we deal with. Uh, the large publicly listed companies, uh, which are typically described as LTD or limited, private companies, which are used um, quite often by what we call mum and dad investors as an investment vehicle, and typically they're designated by PTY LTD or proprietary limited. Um, and then there's the unincorporated associations and so on, charitable organisations. So company law has a wide range of areas that uh, are relevant to it. Um, through the course, you'll be dealing with constitutional law, which I guess is fairly obviously dealing with the federal um, Commonwealth Constitution. There are state constitutions as well, but when we talk about constitutional law, we're really talking about the powers conferred upon the Commonwealth and the residual powers which are left for the states. And in many ways, the arguments that are um, uh, had between the Commonwealth and the state. And also um, the arguments that people put forward in challenging certain state or Commonwealth laws as being un unconstitutional. At the moment, I guess we're all waiting for um, the state government's new laws in relation to um, uh, unlawful or outlaw motorcycle gangs being subject to a constitutional challenge. Um, but there are many instances of where laws are challenged sometimes successfully, sometimes not, on the basis that they're unconstitutional. The next is um, in relation to um, contract law. Um, contract law is um, very, um, very common. Uh, instances of contract, uh, you engage in contracts all the time. Sometimes they're verbal. Um, sometimes they're partly verbal, partly in writing. Sometimes they're in writing. So if you... Uh, if you buy something over the counter for lunch, uh, you may not realise it, but you are, of course, entering into a contract. Um, it's a verbal contract and it's partly performed um, by the actions of parties. At the other end of the scale, you might be buying some real estate and uh, it'll be obvious to you that you're being invited to enter into a contract um, by the fact that you're signing a document which is headed contract. Um, some contracts must be in writing, such as contracts in relation to transactions involving real estate. Other contracts, such as contracts of guarantee, need to be in writing as well. So in contract law, you'll be talking about all those sorts of things. Um, and making distinctions uh, between 
offers and what we call invitations to treat and talking about the elements that make up a contract, talking about the difference between a contract and a deed of agreement. Um, so for example, in a contract typically you might have five elements, whereas in a deed you might only have three elements. So some things look like a contract, but they're not. Other things don't seem like a contract, but they are. So we'll talk about the pros and cons and the, you know, the elements of contract once you do contract law. Uh, criminal law and procedure, of course, um, is fairly obvious, I guess, but we tend to throw into criminal law matters that might be better regarded as, or might be regarded really as quasi-criminal. Uh, so traffic law, traffic infringements, other prosecutions, that might get lumped into criminal law, prosecutions for, from uh, various councils or state government departments, uh, maybe to do with, say, fisheries or, or um, national parks, might, uh, might be the subject of procedures that are very uh, similar to uh, procedures adopted by um, police in prosecution of criminal law matters per se. Um, the, the next matter around, or oh, be, we'll be talking, taking you through in the course, is equity, which is um, the law of trusts, and um, Evidence is something which is covered through a lot of the different uh, subjects that we deal with. Um, we'll be dealing with professional conduct towards the end of the group, trust accounting, etc. And, uh, and of course, a very big one, a substantial one, is property law. Um, property law caters for uh, dealing with issues regarding um, uh, real estate, um, but also personal property such as uh, perhaps the purchase of a uh, motor vehicle. Um, in property law, we often uh, lump in their uh, succession law and um, securities law. So dealing with uh, succession is uh, wills and estates. Um, succession law um, also covers things like powers of attorney and uh, advanced health directives, things that you may have heard of, and you'll study all of those things. Um, and uh, in relation to property law, we also talk about securities law, so mortgages and uh, personal property securities. Um, a very substantial area of law that you'll ca ca uh, cover is a thing called torts law, or tort, T-O-R-T, which deals with actions to do with uh, personal injuries, nuisance, defamation, uh, trespass in a civil sense. So they're all areas of law. And what I propose to do is very briefly, perhaps each week, just give you a little bit more information about some of those areas of practice that you'll be studying and learning as you work your way through the course. Um, well, any questions about that very brief introduction to the areas of practice that we're covering? Uh, any questions about terminology? All right. Now, the next heading that I've got is just making the most of your legal education. It follows on from pages 27 through 33 of the text. I'm going to be um, inviting you to think about how your studies can be applied in a real sense. Law, um, you'll get more out of law if you think in terms of how does this how is, this going to, how is this applied in real practice? Now, I mean, let me just give you a very quick example. So you go into a jewellery store, you see a range of watches, all advertised with a price. You notice that they're all priced the same except for one in the middle, which instead of being $160 is $60. But it looks exactly the same. You make an inquiry at the shopkeeper, what's the difference? The shopkeeper says, well, essentially they're all the same, it's just the different colours. You then say, well, I'd like to buy this one, pointing to the one that's advertised at $60. The shopkeeper takes it out, is about to ring it up as a sale, and then says, I'm sorry, um, it's actually $160, that's, a, that's an error. Now, can, tell, can someone tell me what, is, what are the legal rights there? Do you have, is the shopkeeper obliged to sell it to you at that price? Anyway, I know this is a different topic from what we're doing in introduction, but 
anyone wish to offer an opinion? Well, I would say the answer is no, because uh, the, the price wasn't rung up on the till, so presumably a contract hadn't been entered into at that stage. Okay. Thanks, John. All right, well, I'd agree with you there. From a, a contract point of view, the <laughs> advertising of the price is what we call an invitation to treat. It's um, an opportunity for someone to make an offer by um, saying, I would like this item. So in saying I'd like that watch, that's the offer, and it's the acceptance is through the running it through the till and exchange of um, uh, the money for the item in question. So when you're reading your case law, when you're studying your law, try to think of it in terms of how this will be applied in practice. One very good tip, suggestion, I think, for you is from an early stage, try to, uh, try to um, involve yourself in some real-life legal issues. A very good one, I think, is to go along to community legal centres and see if you can join with a practitioner who's providing free legal advice um, just to observe. Maybe even volunteer uh, when you're suitably qualified to be the person to give that legal advice. Now, as you may be aware, I've been doing some tutoring work for the university for a while now, and I have a very small but enthusiastic group of students in this area who accompany me on a regular basis um, at the community legal centre that, as I mentioned, we, we established many years ago. And they found that a great way to actually apply some of the principles. And it's amazing how many different scenarios arise that get you thinking about law. And it's going to make your studies more interesting if, as you're studying, you're thinking to yourself, how would I apply this in a real-life context in giving advice to someone? And the um, best way to do that is to put yourself a bit to the test and see how senior practitioners go about the process of extracting the legal information or the factual information that's relevant and then providing the legal advice. Um, all right. Um, so well, I guess what we're really saying is that your professional career starts early um, and you'll be applying it very quickly. Um, you'll see that some material in relation to plagiarism, collusion, uh, just be aware that um, uh, that's all something which is treated very seriously throughout um, the studies but also in practice as well. And um, it's all part of your legal identity now um, as to how, about, how you go about training yourself and treating your studies. It'll be reflected, reflected in the way that you're... Um, treated in practice as well. So any questions about anything that I've said so far at this stage? Okay. All right. um, we're getting on towards an hour. That's probably getting close to where we want to wrap up. But I'd like to continue for a bit more if, uh, if you're willing to let me do that. You should probably see the commentary for week two now on the screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Um, I take it you've all done your reading. Are there any questions about that reading generally? You'll see that I've just highlighted a few things. The doctrine of separation of powers, that's topical in terms of the discussions that are um, happening now. Um, and uh, I make reference to the legislation introduced by the attorney over the past um, few weeks, where there are arguments as to whether or not there is a denial of the separation of powers. There's the um, question of English law, the history, the rule of law, separation of powers, doctrine of terra nullius. I take it you've all read that, understand it. If you have any questions about that as we go through, you'll see there that I've extracted some material in relation to uh, 
um, the Mabo decision, that concept which is now overturned as a result of that decision, and the way in which it's been revisited in the WIC decision, which deals with the apparent conflict between pastoral leases and native title, and that WIC decision authority for the, for the fact that the two can coexist. Going through, I take it that you've followed the key terms, that you understand now that common law is really what we mean by case law, which has developed into a, st to a stage where one case can be regarded as a precedent for judges in similar circumstances down the track. The principle there is that if some court has made a decision, then to some degree that decision can be binding upon future courts that come across similar circumstances. Customary, customary law, um, to do with the system of law used by Indigenous Australians. The Magna Carta, uh, not that you'll come across this in practice, but it, I was curious to see where the Carta, which gives people um, some degree of authority and uh, ability to make decisions and have protections of the law, fits in with uh, the timing of um, Longshanks, King Edward, 1280, which you, you'll recall from the, the movie uh, Braveheart, those that seen it, I take it from all we have. And it's interesting that um, King John made the Magna Carta a rule of law and that was um, then the subject of um, problems through King Edward almost straight away afterwards. Separation of powers, we talked about the three arms. Customary law and the principles of secrecy differs from community from, to community and generally not written down. Stop me if there's any questions as we go through this. The principles of equity. Now, this is a, a confusing um, concept. I touched on it last week, but you'll, you'll hear talk of um, legal principles as opposed to equitable principles. But legal principles really implying the law almost in a literal sense, equitable principles applying law on the basis of what is fair, what's appropriate. So there are some maxims that you'll need to become familiar with and you'll need to consider whether equity applies in different circumstances. Now what you've seen in the text is some of the principles but there are a whole lot of others. I've just extracted some others here. Equity does not aid a volunteer. Some comments there. Any questions about law and equity? And then the um, federation, principles of federation. The Murray Court, that's now out, that's gone. So the comment here that it will close at the end of 2012 is historic. The Murray Courts have gone. Um, my personal view is that they did serve a very useful purpose. But in sentencing of the magistrates and other courts, courts are required to consider Indigenous uh, principles that relate to Indigenous um, Australians, in a general sense anyway. And the Murray Courts more formally introduced uh, elders as part of the sentencing process. Characteristics of the Australian legal system, comment B. Section 109 of the Constitution, where a state law is inconsistent with the law of the Commonwealth, then the latter prevails. And the former will be inconsistent, and will be to the extent of the inconsistency, invalid. Or, we talked about administrative law before and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is established 
through the Commonwealth jurisdiction and QCAT before the state jurisdiction. All right. So, before we wrap up, any questions, comments, anything that you want to discuss at more length? I encourage you to use the uh, Moodle site for any questions, comments, and uh, we're very pleased to see that we're up and running as far as Zoom is concerned. Next, yeah. John. Yes, John. Uh, one point, John. Uh, those notes, uh, will they remain up uh, for the duration of the course? I certainly won't remove them. Um, yes, so I expect that they will. All right, so we'll just go around the room. Shelley, anything that you wish to ask or any comments you wish to make? No. No? Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm enjoying it. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you're enjoying it. That's good. That's what it's all about. John, any questions or comments? No. Uh, finding it very long is uh, interesting, taxing because I've never done anything like this before, but it does make you reflect on what you've done during the week. So, yes, I suppose it is of value. Okay, good. Thank you, John. Hi, Rachel. Any Hi. comments? I've got a couple. Um, one of the questions for this week sort of touched on a little bit of what you're talking about tonight, which was the, um, you know, how you'd actually apply things in real life with clients. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the questions was advising a client about, um, you know, what to do after their um, application with counsel for an extension was not back and they believed it was because of a counsellor who didn't like them. Um, I went through the textbook and looked at like the textbook answers and things like that and I had a couple of questions. One was QCAT, even though it's a, an area to review those types of things, when I went to the website it sort of didn't seem to get involved in planning issues, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I may have mentioned, mm. you probably saw I'm a member of QCAT so I get to hear those cases. Um, the type of things that I, for example last week I heard a couple of re review cases one was a, de a decision by a council to declare a particular dog as dangerous and the owner of that dog got that decision reviewed. So that's a matter that went to QCAT. Another um, uh, review decision I did recently was um, a decision by uh, the appropriate department to deny someone a blue card because of certain circumstances and that was then made the subject of a review. So there are examples of administrative or executive decisions that have been made and they, uh, the person seeking a review of that decision went to QCAT. But uh, council decisions would generally go to, I guess, the land court. Um, so it would be a different review process, a different process to challenge. But I guess the point of the exercise was to identify as administrative law. Um, but within that context, there are different places that you can take Okay. Um, and another, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. I just thought that it sort of limits the areas that someone can go into, particularly if they had, um, you know, financial restrictions and that sort of thing. And I just thought that you know one of the options could be to advise them to move. Well, uh, yes, from a practical sense, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, it, it's difficult to look, uh, try and, you know, weigh up the textbook things and, you know, what's best for the client, I guess. Okay. Um, two more questions. One was, um, I got onto Peerwise and was a little overwhelmed with some of the questions. Um, a lot of them are very detailed and very tricky and, um, and yet everyone's saying they're easy. <laughs> yeah, um, I had a comment last week. You've got to be careful about simplistic answers in law and some yes, yeah. that seems to be a simple question deserving of a simple answer is anything but and uh, the appropriate answer can sometimes be quite lengthy and detailed. We try to keep it simple but very often that's not the case. And I've got one more question. Um, am I allowed to ask you about an assignment? We tend to steer clear of specific questions to do with the assignment, don't mind. 
but maybe in a general okay. sense, I'd be able to help. Generally, um, I just wanted to, I was having a little difficulty myself trying to separate um, in our assignment one the legal issues and the law and um, I'm having a, I just was wanting to know if maybe you could give us all some guidance on how best you can look at that um, at such an early stage in the course before we've actually got into, you know, statutory interpretations and things like that. Yeah. Sorry. So a difference between the legal, the law and the legal question. Yeah, um, it's it's number three and number four, which was to um, talk about the issues, explain what the case is about, and um, what main issues needed to be decided by the judge. And then the second one is applying um, those to the facts of the case. And I was just having trouble separating the two. All right. Well, perhaps I can give you an example. This is just off the top of my head. Um, the law says that you're not allowed to drink and drive. That's fairly straightforward. Mm. Question is, if the police charge someone who is behind the wheel and the keys are in the ignition and the engine is running but the car is stationary, are they driving? So in that context, we have the law, we all have to drink and drive, but then we have the legal question, um, given that factual scenario, is that person at law driving a vehicle? Yeah. Okay, thanks. In that particular, in that in, uh, real instance, there are different scenarios and different legislation, but that's the difference between the law and the question to be determined by the court. Okay, thank you. Nothing else, Rachel? Any further questions? No. Okay, great. Thank no, you. thank you. All right, and thanks for participating. Jackie. Any questions yes. or comments? Uh, no, not at the moment, John, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you still going well with that PY tactic? Me? Yes. Yeah, I haven't done the PYs for the last couple of days. I did oh, okay. I was, but yeah. I'm um I, I don't know how people fit everything in sometimes, just the reading and trying to follow stuff up. It's um so long and I'm really part time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it can be and it was Melbourne Cup today. <laughs> Miss that. <laughs> and Kelly, thank you. thank you very much for participating tonight, Kelly, and um, observing. Do you have any questions or any comments that you wish to make? No, no, nothing, nothing in particular. I sort of look forward to seeing how things play out. So it'll be good. Okay. All right. Um, well, we might wrap it up. And uh, just a reminder, Kelly's going to leave the uh, leave the session next week. So thank you very much for that, Kelly. And uh, no thank you all for participating. And at that stage, we might end the session now. So all the best. Bye. 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 Bye.